Copeland, Appalachian Spring. Aaron Copeland was born in Brooklyn, New York on November 14, 1900, the fifth of five children. His parents had immigrated to the United States from Lithuania, and in the process, his father had anglicized the family name of Kaplan to Copeland. Copeland's father, Harris, built a prosperous family business, and Copeland grew up, a first-generation American, comfortably ensconced in the middle class. An ethos of hard work and pride shaped Copeland's family, pride at what they had accomplished and pride in the country that had given them the opportunity to do so. Copeland later wrote, quote, My father was a strong figure in the eyes of his family and his employees. Father was justifiably proud of what he had accomplished in the business world, but above all, he never let us forget that it was America that had made all this possible." Unquote. Copeland was something of a musical late bloomer. He only began playing piano at the age of 13. Hey, let's hear it for late bloomers. They don't need tiger mommies. They do things because they want to and not because they are forced to. Copeland's passion for music led him to take total control of his own musical education. He found and hired his own piano teachers, took correspondence courses in harmony and theory, and eventually worked himself up the local education ladder so that in early 1917 he began studying with Reuben Goldmark, about whom we spoke earlier. After graduating from high school, Copeland completed his music education with the formidable Nadia Boulanger at her school in Fontainebleau, outside of Paris. Copeland studied with Madame for three years, from 1921 to 1924. During that time, he got his compositional chops, traveled Europe, and seems to have met and charmed everyone. Copeland biographer Vivian Perlis writes, quote, Copeland had gone to Europe to learn how to compose, and he had found America while viewing it from abroad. He saw European composers take up American jazz and thought that if composers like Debussy and Ravel, Stravinsky and Millot could use ragtime and jazz rhythms, the way might be open for American composers to do so as well. Perhaps, he thought. Here finally was music an American might write better than a European." Unquote. Copeland returned to the United States in 1924 at an auspicious time, just a few months after the premiere of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue at a concert dedicated to incorporating jazz into concert works. Copeland later wrote, quote, I was anxious to write a work that would immediately be recognized as American in character. This desire to be American was symptomatic of the period. I had experimented with the rhythms of popular music in several earlier compositions, but now I wanted frankly to adopt the jazz idiom and see what I could do with it in a symphonic way." Unquote. The first piece Copeland wrote on returning to the United States was his jazz-inspired Music for the Theater a spare and angular work for a theater-sized orchestra that incorporated jazz and American musical theater elements into an otherwise entirely Copeland-esque composition. Many years later, Copeland wrote, quote, The jazz element in music for the theater was further developed in my next work, a concerto for piano and orchestra. This proved to be the last of my experiments with symphonic jazz. With the concerto, I felt I had done all I could with the idiom. True, it was an easy way to be American in musical terms, but all American music could not possibly be confined to the two dominant jazz moods, the blues and the snappy number. However, the characteristic rhythmic element of jazz, being purely indigenous, will continue to be used in serious native music." Unquote. With that quote, Copeland tells us two important things. First, he correctly asserts that there's a West African-inspired rhythmic punch endemic to American music. He also tells us something about himself, that as a composer, he was an exoticist, a composer who employed a variety of national idioms in his music. Appalachian Spring, 
1944 to 1945. The Great Depression began with the stock market crash on October 29, 1929, and ended when the United States declared war on Japan 12 years later, on December 8, 1941, a day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. There was a belief during the Depression that the fine arts should address not just an elite few, but rather the many, the common man. This spirit of populism was, if anything, magnified during the war, when national pride was as important to the war effort as metal drives and victory gardens. Aaron Copeland was deeply affected by the populist spirit of the time. He later wrote, quote, In all the arts, the Depression had aroused a wave of sympathy for and identification with the plight of the common man. There was a market for music evocative of the American scene, industrial backgrounds, landscapes of the Far West, and so forth. We composers were pleased to find ourselves sought after and were ready to compose in a manner that would satisfy both our audiences and ourselves." Unquote. Among Copland's best-known populist works are Billy the Kid of 1938, Rodeo, a Lincoln portrait, and Fanfare for the Common Man, all of 1942, and Appalachian Spring of 1944. Appalachian Spring was composed as a ballet, commissioned, choreographed, and danced by Martha Graham. She conceived of the ballet as a springtime celebration around a newly built farmhouse in Pennsylvania during the early part of the 19th century. The ballet received its premiere at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. on October 30, 1944. In 1945, Copeland's score was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in Music. It was also in 1945 that Copland paired the 14-part ballet down to an eight-part suite for orchestra, a sort of Appalachian Springs greatest hits. It is this version that we will hear in concert and on the vast majority of recordings. The goal of our examination of Appalachian Spring will be to appreciate Copland as an American composer, as a synthesis of his European training his American folklorist leanings, and his spare and angular musical voice that has become a metaphor for the wide open spaces of the American landscape.